Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. Intelligent life is an extremely unlikely certainty. It is unlikely because the number of things that have to go right before it can occur is truly mind-boggling. And yet it is a certainty because it did occur right here on Earth with you and me. And once an event has occurred, the odds of that occurrence become 100%, no matter how unlikely it seemed to begin with. As near as we can tell, this was quite unusual. As we look out across the universe, we think we see desolate, lifeless planet after desolate, lifeless planet. Still, given the sheer number of planets that exist, how likely is it that intelligent life sprang up not once, but twice, or even more times? Are we alone in the universe? What are the probabilities? I'm Alex McColgan and you're watching Astrum. Today we shall have a stab in the dark at solving these mysteries and see what we hit. To begin with though, let's start with a caveat. If we're going to try to figure out what the odds are of intelligent life existing in the universe, we should ask ourselves the question, what do we mean by life? Life on planet Earth comes in many shapes and sizes, from the tallest trees to the smallest microbes, from spindly insects to birds or fish or humans. Our planet is teeming with life. We generally understand what we mean when we say a living thing. We might define it by it moving around or by it growing. Generally speaking, scientists define life as any system that is capable of eating, metabolizing, excreting, breathing, moving, growing, reproducing, and responding to external stimuli. Essentially, they are aware of their surroundings in some way. They seek resources. They take those resources into themselves and they use them to grow or create more of themselves. And then they get rid of any waste that's left over. Ew. Some forms of life are much more active than others, but even things like plants can move to face the sun, open their buds, or spread out their roots over time. So we look at these things and consider them living. Even on Earth though, there are some systems like viruses that push the boundary of what it means to be a living thing. Viruses are so simple that they lack the ability to reproduce by themselves or to metabolize. Instead, they get cells they infect to do that work for them. Are viruses alive? They certainly have proved devastating to other populations of living things, and we can definitely think of them that way. But it's a debate that still rages on in the scientific community. So, although there are certain qualities that are fairly universal for living things here on Earth, we must be careful about how we go about defining life. For instance, most living things on Earth make use of water to function. It carries important nutrients around our bodies and is so vital for all life on Earth that we consider the absence of water to be a serious red flag if another planet doesn't have it. But if an alien was somehow able to exist by pumping liquid methane through its body instead of water, would that stop it from being a living thing? Probably not. So let's keep an open mind, but roughly let's define life as those things that seek out resources, grow and reproduce. Whether those creatures are predominantly water, like us, or whether they are made from some other elements, or even pure energy, it doesn't really matter. All we care about is the likelihood of them reaching a level of intelligence where they might be able to talk to us. To get to that level, there are still a number of things that need to go right. To begin with, they would most likely need a star to orbit. As near as we can tell, life cannot exist without energy. They would need a planet that suited them. They would need to compete with other organisms for limited resources, thus encouraging them to adapt and progress. In time, they would need to develop problem-solving skills and intelligence as a way of gaining those resources and outcompeting their rivals. Their civilization would then have to survive without accidentally becoming extinct due to a freak meteor strike or earthquake or global freezing they would also have to not destroy themselves. 
they would have to invest in technology and would have to develop a level of technology that allowed them to reach out across the universe. They'd also have to have a desire to talk to any potential neighbors as opposed to being intensely isolationist. And finally, would have to broadcast a signal out to us for long enough that we would be able to spot them. All of this is by no means certain. However, as was pointed out by astronomer and astrophysicist Frank Drake in the first SETI meetings in 1961, all of this could be used to calculate the probability of us finding alien life. He laid all this out in his famous Drake equation. This may look a little complicated, but it's based on a very clever and logical idea. Using the same logic that says you can figure out how many students are in a school by calculating how many students were inducted into the school at the start of each year, and then multiplying that by the number of years students studied for, Drake reasoned that the way of calculating the number of civilizations in our galaxy, whose electromagnetic emissions are detectable, could be calculated, provided you knew the rates at which those other steps happened. Let's break it down. N is the number we're looking for. How many alien races are out there for us to see or hear? This will give us an idea of the odds of finding them. Our star is the rate of formation of stars suitable for the development of intelligent life, in number per year. Not all stars are very suitable for life to develop, as some are too cold, or too hot, or generally too unstable. We need to know how many are being born that could support life. Fp is the fraction of those stars with planets. Ne is the number of those planets, per solar system, with atmospheres and material compositions suitable for life. If they're covered with lava, or are completely devoid of atmosphere or water, it's unlikely that life could form there, based on our own planet's example. Fl is the fraction of how many of those planets that could support life, actually do support life. Fi is the fraction of planets for which that life becomes intelligent, Fc is the fraction of times that life advances enough technologically to start sending out signals of their existence. And finally, L is the length of time a civilization exists on average. If you combine all of these elements, you could accurately predict how many alien civilizations we would be able to see up in our sky right now. Of course, you might have noticed a drawback with this equation. Some of these numbers are simply not known by us. But where's the fun in not giving it a go anyway? By inputting the numbers that scientists currently believe to be most likely, and by making a few assumptions of my own along the way, we will attempt to solve the Drake equation. If you think that any of my numbers seem unreasonable, let me know in the comments below. So with that, let's see how many alien civilizations we might reasonably expect to see out in the night sky. To begin with, we can input our values with reasonable certainty. Scientists looking at the Milky Way galaxy can accurately predict how many stars form every year, as we have many examples to draw from. Depending on who you ask, the number ranges from between 3 and 7. Let's say 5 at a conservative estimate. Fp is easy to solve too. Through recent astronomical observations by the Kepler Space Telescope, it's become apparent that planets are very common in the solar system, with each star on average having one. So let's set this number high as well, let's say 90%. However, the number that we currently predict is at a suitable distance from their stars, as well as having the ideal mix of elements that would produce life similar to ours is much lower. Of the 100 billion planets in the solar system, perhaps as few as 300 million fit into this category. Obviously, this does not account for alien life that's significantly different from us, but let's discount them for the moment as then this would be even harder to predict. This gives us a percentage chance of 0.3%, quite a small chance that one of the planets in a solar system is suitable for life, so 0.003 for NE. So far, so substantiated by evidence. Here is where things get a little tricky. For the number of times that life has arisen, we only have one example to draw from, life on Earth. To date, we have not proved that life arose on Mars or Ganymede, for all the conjecture on that front. 
So we can take this estimate one of two ways. As near as we can tell from the fossil record, as soon as the planet cooled down enough, life came into being, which might indicate a high value for F, perhaps as high as a certainty one. But on the other hand, from what we know, all life originated from a common ancestor, which is to say, life formed on this planet from non-biological matter exactly once, and has never risen up again since. Scientists have looked for evidence of bacteria that might have independently come into being, but so far haven't found any. This may be a coincidence. Perhaps life did arise multiple times, but the life that arose first was more advanced, and so outcompeted the newly formed simple bacteria into extinction. Still, it means that life is either incredibly certain, or a million to one. Let's go with the more pessimistic number, and see where that takes us. FL equals 0.0001%. We encounter the same problem for the arising of intelligence. There are numerous examples of animals displaying forms of intelligence. Octopi can open jars and solve puzzles, and some birds and apes can use tools or even use sign language. Perhaps this proves that, given enough time, life always evolves into becoming more intelligent. However, if we want to be strict about it, we could also accurately say that all the millions of species that have existed on the Earth, only one was intelligent enough for our purposes. Us. Which makes the odds seem very low for it happening. Let's once again input our 1 million to 1 value for Fi, again, just to be pessimistic. In terms of how many become technologically advanced enough to start communicating, I think this number is likely much higher. Although we only have one species to compare to again, it's worth noting that humans are unintentionally chatty with the universe, quite by accident. Thanks to industry and transport, we are altering the chemical composition of our atmosphere, which is something an alien race could detect. Certain molecules in our atmosphere are only there because they are man-made. We also send signals out into space thanks to our radio signals and satellites. Sometimes we even send signals out into the stars deliberately, such as the Arecibo message, which was broadcast from Earth in 1974, and contained information about human civilization and history, expressly so any aliens that heard it could learn about us. Although these signals would not travel far on the grand cosmological scale of things before becoming dispersed and indistinguishable from background radiation, we would count as a communicating race. So I'm going to predict this number as high. Let's say 70% of intelligent races reach this level. Finally, how long do civilizations survive? For this number, sadly we do not even have a single example. We do not know how long our race will survive until we die out, by which point there will be no one left to write down the final figure. However, although there are numerous dangers that could end us as a species, ranging from meteor strikes, nuclear war, or even solar flares, the longer we are able to survive, the more likely it is that we will go on surviving. This is because, once humanity spreads out, we become more and more resilient to a species threatening catastrophe. If we are on multiple planets, a comet hitting Earth would no longer threaten the survival of our species. If we are in multiple solar systems, a solar flare would no longer be able to get all of us. Species could, in theory, reach a sort of immortality level in this way, lasting for potentially billions of years as long as they could get out of the danger range. Let's be optimistic and use this figure. What does that give us for the Drake Equation? Based on these assumptions, our answer is zero in our galaxy. If civilizations live for trillions of years, which is longer than the universe has existed for, we'd still be at zero for these values. Given these odds, our chances of ever hearing from another civilization is next to non-existent. But that's just the thing with this kind of estimate. If we instead assumed that life arising was certain, and that intelligence arising was certain too, our final answer for even a 1000 year civilization would no longer be zero. Instead, that comes to an answer of 9 in our galaxy. 9 intelligent races 
who might be up in the stars right now trying to communicate with us. And if races routinely do make it to functional immortality to the point where their civilizations last for billions of years, then we would see as many as 9,450,000 in our galaxy, or more. I know these are hypotheticals, but I find this very interesting. Putting the numbers through the equation makes it a bit more tangible, a bit more magical and exciting even. According to the Drake equation, the sky could be completely silent or absolutely teeming with alien life. If it is the former, then we should probably prepare ourselves for a long, lonely existence. We should learn to get along with each other, because we are all the life we are ever going to see. There will be no alien stopping by to say hello. But if it is the latter, it leads to a very important question. Where are they all? But that is a question we will have to look at in the next video of this series. For now, my own biggest takeaway from this is that we need to try to refine some of these numbers. Through the efforts of rovers like Perseverance on Mars, we are already taking steps towards attempting to find alien life within our own solar system. The more we are able to narrow these numbers down, the more certain we will be as to our odds of finding alien civilizations. Until we find one, it's all a question of odds. And whether the chances are high or low, well, that's very much up to you. So, write in the comments, what do you think, or what would you rather? If solving equations and contemplating probabilities is something you enjoy, but you haven't really got an idea where to start, then today's sponsor, Brilliant, will be right up your street. While I get the logic of equations, Maths has never been a strong suit of mine. I even have to get people to double check any maths that features in my scripts. But Brilliant has a course called Pre-Algebra, where they bridge the gap between arithmetic and algebra in a visual and interactive way, using fun to solve puzzles, something I very much enjoy. Using their platform, I now understand algebra a lot better now than when I was taught in school. They have a whole host of other courses around STEM topics, so if you want to challenge yourself and have fun while learning, try out Brilliant today. To get started for free, click brilliant.org forward slash astrum in the description and the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. I highly recommend it. Thanks for watching, liking and sharing. And thanks to my patrons and members for supporting the channel. Want to support too and have your name added to this list? Find the links in the description below. All the best and see you next time.